Hey, it's Brandon here. Welcome to Transform Your Workplace. Thanks for the download today. Today's episode is brought to you by Zenium HR. Learn more about Zenium's complete HR plus payroll solution and learning and development programs at zeniumhr.com. Today's episode features John Crone. He is the co-founder and chief data scientist of Nebula IO. And this is probably the deepest dive in AI and deep learning than I've ever gone on this show. But if you really want to know how AI and deep learning are impacting the human resources industry and how it's impacting job searching, recruiting and hiring, this is a great episode to start with. John talks about how AI and deep learning can really help us be effective in finding the right fit. And he's here to show us what's possible with this new technology. Enjoy today's episode. Make sure to connect with me on LinkedIn and connect with John on LinkedIn as well. He's really active on there and he even has a podcast on deep learning as well. So go check that out. We'll put links in the show notes and the blog post. Enjoy the conversation with John Crone. John, it's a pleasure to have you on Transform Your Workplace. Thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, I don't know if you know this, but you are the most popular HR tech podcast in the world. Did you know that? I did not know that. How did you figure that out? We have gone and cataloged all of the HR tech podcasts and all the recruitment tech podcasts in the world, and you come out as the most listened to, period, in the world. What? Yeah. No way. I knew that, like our downloads are pretty <laughs> yes, good, but and we were, we've had the show long. You're like you're totally stumping me with this. I was not prepared for that, and I appreciate. And you're it. in the top one percent of podcasts globally, and uh, there's very few HR tech or recruitment tech podcasts that make it into that top one percent. And of the handful, there's like five that are in the top one percent. Wow, yours is number one. That's incredible. We've kept our show pretty general. We cover a lot of different topics around the workplace, and. Maybe that's benefited me by not going so narrow and, and specializing in a certain topic. But yeah, I, I really appreciate you saying that. I want to get into you. So you are into deep learning, AI, and we've touched on a few topics on that. We've scratched the surface and you're probably smarter than the average person I talk to. And I, I'm just ready to d dive deep into this. So give me a little overview uh, and for listeners too of your journey into the world of data science what led you to co-found Nebula, especially like focusing on like AI and where it's at now with the like recruiting technology. I, I feel like it's the tip of the iceberg. So give me your background. Yeah, for sure. So I have been doing data science for longer than data science has been a term. So I did a PhD applying machine learning to medical sciences data. And so that was like genetic data, brain imaging data, and that was up until 2012 that I finished the PhD. It was around 2012 that the term data science was coined. And so to kind of get these definitions in there, data science is a pretty big catch-all phrase that includes lots of different kinds of data-related activities. So it's kind of primarily characterized by training models that are able to then predict things that are outside of the training data set. So statistics, maybe a lot of people, maybe even a lot of your listeners have taken like statistics courses in university. That would count as data science. That's a data science approach. But today it is much more common, much more widespread to use machine learning to train those models instead. So statistics and machine learning are two different kinds of data science approaches to training algorithms based on data so that they can make predictions in real time. Interesting. Give me the, the difference between just data science, machine learning, machine learning is it is as it's described, which is it's self learning. Maybe it's, is it developing? Like describe that for me. Yeah. So great question. So machine learning is a subset of a broader area called artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence. It's an approach that's been around for decades that is around allowing machines to in some way mimic the way that 
humans process information. And artificial intelligence techniques have been around for many decades. And say in the 90s, the leading artificial intelligence approach was something called expert systems. With expert systems, computer programmers wrote lines of code that told the machine how it should behave. So the most famous example of an expert system is probably IBM's Deep Blue computer, which defeated Gary Kasparov at chess in the 90s to much fanfare, lots of television rights sold to that. And in that kind of system, you had chess experts telling programmers how they play chess and how you might want to beat Gary Kasparov. And then they would write code to be like, okay, when Gary Kasparov opens with this pawn move, then here are like some ideas for how to follow up in that kind of scenario. And so it's humans writing code to determine how that AI system should behave. So that's expert systems. That is not machine learning. An alternative AI approach is machine learning. With machine learning, instead of having somebody hand code how the machine behaves, the machine learns from training data. And so there's lots of different kinds of machine learning. So you could have some where you could have a whole bunch of images of cats and dogs. Like say you download a thousand images from the internet, half of them are labeled as cats, half of them are labeled as dogs, and you have like a human like come and put those labels there. You could train a machine learning algorithm to be able to recognize what kinds of images are cats and what kinds of images are dogs. So in that case, you don't have anybody programming oh, like we've got to look for these kinds of colors or this kind of shape of a head. The machine learning algorithm figures out what are cats and what are dogs based just on the training data alone. Now, today, within that category of machine learning, which is a subset of AI, there is another subcategory. So we're kind of like nesting in a Venn diagram here. AI is biggest. Inside there, we got machine learning. And inside of machine learning, we've got this specific machine learning approach called deep learning. The way that deep learning works is that it is inspired by the way that biological brains work. So if you look around you, you are using the visual cortex of your brain. So it's, it's a part of your brain on the back of your head. So information goes from your eyes to the back of your skull. And the first layer of brain cells that processes information in the back of your skull can only process straight lines. So these are very simple recognition capabilities, but that first layer of information, those straight lines get passed to a second layer of brain cells, which can recombine those straight lines into corners and curves. And then you have a third layer of processing that takes those corners and curves and turns them into even more complex, more abstract shapes. And so you can imagine that after many dozens of layers of that kind of processing, you go from straight lines to very complex, very abstract shapes like being able to recognize Brandon's face or John's face or your grandma's face or a cat or a dog or whatever. So deep learning is based on that same idea. Deep learning, the algorithms for it have been around since the 1950s. So in the 1950s, we were starting to learn more about the brain and a researcher at Cornell University said, hey, I'm gonna design an algorithm, a computer program that loosely mimics the way that we understand brain cells to work. And so he created this algorithm called an artificial neuron or artificial brain cell. And that artificial neuron, very, very simple algorithm, but the power comes from having lots of them. So you'll have a layer with maybe thousands or even millions of these artificial neurons. And if it's a computer vision algorithm that is say recognizing cats and dogs, then that first layer of artificial brain cells will just recognize straight lines at particular orientations. And then you have the algorithm pass that information to a second layer. The second layer will recombine those straight lines into corners and curves. And then the third layer will recombine those corners and curves into more complex, more abstract shapes until after several dozens of layers of these artificial neurons, you're able to represent very complex visual objects like Brandon's face or John's face or grandma's face or a cat or a dog or whatever. So deep learning is characterized by having these artificial brain cells layered deeply, which makes them very powerful for recognizing complex patterns and being able to do it in a way without any human input. You just, the human just says, hey, okay, I'm going to have an, an artificial neural network with this many layers and this many neurons per layer. You provide it with the data, you provide it with those images of cats and dogs that I was talking about earlier, and it just automatically figures out 
what it needs to do to be able to distinguish cats and dogs. So that approach, deep learning, is what's driving the huge amount of innovation that we see in artificial intelligence today. And the reason why that's happening today and didn't happen in the 50s is because it turns out that for this to work effectively, you need a lot of training data and you need a lot of computing power, which every year we have more and more of. So every year we get huge new capabilities in AI that kind of just emerge from having huge deep learning artificial neural networks trained on huge amounts of data and then crazy things, just crazy capabilities basically automatically emerge like everything you see from ChatGPT. Right. That was going to be my next question to you is like, what's driving this advancement? And it, it did seem like computing power because it's getting better and better every year. But the amount of input, the data that's going into these AI systems, deep learning, like from here on out, exponential growth, wouldn't you think? I mean, you you know this world better now. What, what are you going to see in two, three years? Yeah, that is the idea. So that's why NVIDIA is now one of the world's most valuable companies because they make the computer chips, the graphics processing units, the GPUs that allow these deep learning systems to train rapidly. And so NVIDIA is cranking out as many of these as they can. At the time of recording uh, this podcast episode, there were recently rumors that Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, is trying to raise up to six or seven trillion dollars for a chip startup because chips hardware are ultimately what is driving AI innovation. There's a bit of scientific innovation that sometimes makes a huge difference, but the bottleneck right now in capabilities, it's an engineering problem more than a science problem. It's about getting enough of these chips together and training them long enough to get more and more powerful emergent properties from the AI systems. That's fascinating. So the computing power and the algorithms and the, the data is there, but there's the bottleneck because of the, the processing power, like the chip itself, the hardware. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's where the biggest immediate opportunity is. It's what we call scaling. So these algorithms already today, like GPT-4 or the GPT-5 that's being trained now by OpenAI, or the Gemini that's come out of Google or Llama out of Meta, these algorithms already train on essentially all of the language on the internet. So there's not that much more data that's available. So there is probably a lot more room for capability growth just from scaling up the deep learning system. So to, to give you a sense of that, the state-of-the-art deep learning architectures a decade ago might have had a million what we call model weights, like things that can be learned. Basically, like those artificial neurons that I was describing earlier, connecting each one of the artificial neurons in the system is something called a model weight. And basically, the number of model weights a decade ago was like a million. The number of model weights in GPT-4, they never published this, but it was probably about a trillion, maybe two trillion. So that's many, many, many orders of magnitude more and that allows for these surprising emerging properties. Like the people who are working on these systems at OpenAI or Google, they don't know what the system is going to be able to do when it's done training. Really? That's a little scary. <laughs> right. That does scare some people. Absolutely. That's why there's probably a lot of powerful people thinking like, we need to maybe pump the brakes or have some some policies or, around this because if, if they don't know what the outcome is going to be when it's done training, like that is a little Skynet-ish. Exactly. <laughs> so for sure, there's a lot of policy people that are like, at what point is an enemy sovereign nation having access to a system like this potentially an existential risk yeah. for our country? So yeah, it's a... Uh, it's definitely something that policy people are thinking about. I don't personally worry too much about those things. <laughs> trying to put it to good use. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's great that people are concerned. I think we should be concerned. I would say that there are a lot of people out there who are concerned, and there's a lot of people doing that who are much more smarter than me and are trying to come up with ways to ensure that the good outcomes outweigh the bad. I am a believer <laughs> that things like AI systems... Actually, for me, it's a no-brainer that they are a net benefit because with AI systems, with data, we can track things in a way that you can't when humans are making decisions. So in the space that your listeners are probably most concerned about in human resources, for thousands of years, people have been making hiring decisions, probably like farmhands or 
cobblers or whatever would have been the roles you were hiring for centuries ago, thousands of years ago. And throughout all of human history, there was no record of like why you were choosing one farmer over another, or one cobbler over another. But I am very much willing to bet that irrelevant biases around race or gender played a huge role in those decisions. And of course, that still does happen today, but by tracking data, by using machine learning algorithms, you can be more confident that you are not recapitulating those same biased decisions if you're doing things carefully. And so that's something, there's a lot of ways that you can do machine learning dangerously, but companies like ours, like Nebula, we've invested a huge amount of R&D money in ensuring that our algorithms do not treat people from different races and genders differently. And we even have a patent that has been awarded on how we have trained a deep learning model specifically for human resources um, without recapitulating biases that may be present in the training data. All of the big companies that release big machine learning models like OpenAI, like Google, like Meta, Microsoft, they are hugely concerned with these kinds of issues, although mostly only in very recent years. And there's been some very specific people um, working at these companies or outside of these companies. Joy Bulamwini is an example of someone like this. She's, there's a, a documentary called Coded Bias that has won a number of awards. And Joy Bulamwini, who was a researcher at MIT, discovered lots of biases in face recognition algorithms, for example. And these kinds of discoveries just a few years ago, have really shined a microscope on what machine learning researchers are doing. And now the biggest machine learning conferences out there, they have specific tracks and funding opportunities specifically for people to be looking for where biases occur in algorithms and to, and to stamp them out as much as possible. And the whole summary point of that is that that isn't something that you can do confidently with human behavior. Yeah, the people I've talked to, uh, their concerns about you know generative AI, deep learning into the human resources field, like talent acquisition, recruiting, is that there's still going to be inherent bias because whether it's the engineers who created the algorithm, they're they're naturally biased. But if in all the training information that's going into these systems. Will there be a way to reduce bias overall? And it sounds like you're working on it. You you probably can't share the secrets because you, you have a patent and, and it's probably not something you want to share with competitors. But how do you think about it? Like, what are you doing specifically to reduce bias in, in your technology, for example? So the simplest thing, and anybody can do this, this is not in any way patented, is just looking at the results. So uh, breaking down your results by group, so by race, by gender, and particularly something that Joy Budamwini, who I just mentioned, something that she uncovered that is really important, is also looking at what we call in statistics the interaction between those two things. So for example, a big thing that she uncovered was that for face recognition algorithms, the algorithms underperformed on women relative to men, and they underperformed on darker skinned people relative to lighter skinned people by a bit. It was still a problem, but when you took the interaction of those two things and you studied how the algorithm performed on women with darker colored skin, it performed atrociously, like was basically worse than random. And um, these are the kinds of things that you need to be monitoring for. So in the human resources space, this involves things like taking in our platform in Nebula, taking a job description and searching over our database for relevant candidates for that role and ensuring that men and women on average get the same score for that role, that every major race group gets the same average score, and then same thing with the interaction terms. So that, you know, for example, darker skinned women are being treated equally to lighter skinned men. With all this advancement in deep learning, AI, what are the, some of the most exciting trends that you see when it comes to the, the HR space? The, the people leadership, the recruiting, like that whole industry, the technology is coming fast. And I, I don't think a lot of people even listening to this podcast are prepared for it, but I want to get them excited to, so they can you know learn more about it how, and how they can approach within their people practices. What are you excited about? So I'm sure a lot of your listeners have had the experience of putting a job out, say on LinkedIn, and then having hundreds of applications come in. I've done that. And it is a harrowing process where you have to there's say there's 200 people that have applied you've got to go through those 200 profiles and you try 
to make really good judgment calls. So my kind of qualitative experience with this is that for the first like four or five people out of say the 200 that are in the list, I am extremely careful with those profiles. I'm looking for reasons why I need to include them. Like I'm kind of like, you know, this isn't the kind of person that I thought would be good for this job, but maybe actually they could work. And then after kind of four or five of really carefully going through profiles, you start to be like, oh man, you just got to like find a way to get through these more quickly. I've got 195 to go. <laughs> the first five took half an hour. This isn't going to work. So you're not looking at it closely after the the five that you were going deep into the profile. So then you're just kind of like looking for some reason to like definitely exclude someone. Like you're just like scanning it quickly to try to be like, no, they're not a fit. They're not a fit. You're just trying to get rid of people. And so that means that you're missing tons of great people and you're spending a huge amount of time on this. So a solution like Nebula offers is that we can take anyone in that list of 200 or something that we do in real time is we have a public database of every working person in the US, like anyone who has public information. So 180 million people. And we can in seconds, in under five seconds, take some kind of natural language query that you provide, like find me a data scientist in New York or find me a nurse in Austin, Texas. And we will rank everyone in those 180 million people in the US instantly for the text that you put in. And it could be just a simple bit of natural language, like I just said, like find me a data scientist in New York, or it could be a job description, or it could be the ideal candidate profile, you know, the one that got away, or even a combination of people. Like you could take five people that you know are great performers in this data science role at this particular company that you're hiring for. You could take those five profiles, throw them all into our tool at once, and instantly, in seconds, under five seconds, we'll rank everyone in the US for that you know, kind of ideal profile that you mash together. That is like an example of not something futuristic, but literally something you can do today. I mean, you're doing it right now, yeah. Well, and that's, you know, leading to my next question is like for employers, you know, leaders, hiring managers who have now at their disposal tons of AI powered tools, how do they reasonably figure out what the right tools are for them that won't have bias built into it, are going to be efficient for their business and effective in their talent acquisition. I mean, obviously you're working on it with Nebula, but even just holistically, if we step back and just with all the AI tools that are available, ChatGPT, Jasper, now Adobe Suite has generative AI built in. It's like there's all these options, so many subscription options. Where do we even start? How do you even begin to think about this? Yeah, that is a tricky question. It does. It always feels like there's too many different kinds of things out there to try. I guess to some extent with how quickly things move, you should probably, as somebody who's deciding on what kinds of platforms are being used for HR in your company, you should have some time set aside each week for just trying out some new tools. And there's probably going to be a fair bit of buzz around firms that have recently raised venture capital. So that's something to potentially look out for. Listening to podcasts like yours is obviously, that's a great way to try to keep up with what's going on. And yeah, and then you might hear about tools like Nebula and you're just like, okay, well, I'll try that out. It doesn't it typically doesn't take long to try these kinds of tools out. Uh, most of these kinds of platforms have a button on the website that says, I'd like to have a demo and you can get a live demo with somebody. And that person can talk you through the kinds of issues like you're describing around bias. And they should have good answers, solid answers around bias, for example. I guess one other big consideration when you're making these kinds of decisions would be integrations with the existing systems that you have or selecting tools that consolidate many of those systems together into one. And that is something that we're trying to do with Nebula. We certainly can do to an extent. It feels like you know, for me as a co-founder of the company, I'm like, wow, I can't wait till that next step and like where we're going to be. But even today, things like sourcing the way I described, you know, searching across everyone in the US and then being able to understand the results of that search, getting compensation benchmarks, for example, from our tool. So you do the sourcing, compensation benchmarks, competitor analysis, what kinds of schools you should be sourcing at, related job titles, all of that stuff you get in our platform. And then you can look up contact details, you can engage with people. So our platform, obviously I'm super biased to talking about our platform, but there's other HR tools out there like ours that would allow you to consolidate many of the systems that you're working with or integrate with the systems that you already have. The more that you can go with the systems 
that allow you to consolidate into one tool will reduce the risk of things going wrong. Because anytime you're trying to integrate across multiple different providers, then a failure in any one of those providers is going to lead to an issue with your whole chain. Or if one of those providers changes their pricing or changes the way things connect, you're going to have headaches. So the less chaining that you need to do with with different providers is, is probably a great idea as well. What's your vision for Nebula? I mean, you just mentioned compensation. I had no idea that you were even doing benchmarking for compensation. That's a very complicated topic. Like there's a few big players that were data sources for compensation, but it's not perfect. And it varies by market and it varies based on job duties and titles. What are you doing in that space? Describe that. Yeah, so we have approached this in a new way that I'm super excited about and I think works really well because... The way that our compensation benchmarking works is, first of all, where the data comes from for this is from W-2s, so from people literally doing their taxes. And obviously, we can't get those data on an individual level. Like, I can't get what Brandon's compensation is, but I can get people with your job title in your location, with your number of years of experience, with the skill set that you have. And so you can, from that set of information, you get highly specific compensation data. And we put it, and this is probably related to our data science kind of first, our AI native platform, is that we show that information for you, even on an individual level, as a distribution, as a comp distribution. So, so you're getting, you know, if this person is a median performer, this is the kind of pay they would expect. If they're a 90th percentile performer with this particular job title, location, years of experience, these particular skills, this is what they should be paid. And then we can aggregate that up across your entire search. So for a very specific search that you do in our platform, which could be in a specific region with a specific skill set, and you don't manually specify with our platform, you don't manually specify the skill set. We guess what the appropriate skill set is. We run that past you. So we have a generative AI tool. So you can come into the platform and say, find me a data scientist in New York. And based on that small amount of information, data scientist, we will guess what the relevant skills are. And we will guess what relevant job titles are. And then we'll show that to you when we do the search and you can make adjustments, but we're saving you time. So you don't need to be like going through drop down list, picking skills. Anyway, the point is that in a very flexible, dynamic way that minimizes work for you, we will across your entire search, get you that aggregated comp curve across all the top people that come back in your search. And so you can, in this highly granular way, in a way that I'm not aware of, you can do in any other tool, you can get a great sense of what you need to be paying people. Um, so you could take the same search input, the same language, and try it in Kansas versus New York City versus countrywide. How does that change the shape? Or if you add in this set of skills or remove this set of skills, how does that change comp? And yeah, so it's unlike all of the other comp tools that I'm aware of out there, they're based on the specific buckets. It's like this job title in this area. That's it. Yeah. That also, it also feels real time versus I think a lot of the, the other data sources are lagging. It's like historical data. So it's not relevant to like current inflation rates. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you say that because in addition to using W2s, which are obviously about a year old, in addition to that, we also leverage live job posting data to weight the, uh, the compensation estimates towards where they are today, as opposed to where they have been historically. You know what's like going through my head about a tool like this? Like, let's say Nebula becomes like the product in this space and everybody's using it. Wouldn't it make it ultra competitive? Like for, for people who are using the tool, like what if you're bringing back the same results of the same person in the same comp data? It seems like it'd be ultra competitive. Like you're all throwing, you're trying to throw money, the same compensation at the same person. And then that would cause people to go outside the range and fight for that talent. Like, wh wh how do you think about that? I think that, that problem is not specific to, to AI or anything that's changed recently. I mean, that's any, any time over past decades where, where you have data, yeah, on like what people should be getting paid. I don't think that like the new level of granularity that we allow you to get with Nebula makes a huge difference on that problem. But also that problem that you're describing is specific to people saying, oh, like I'm looking for a software developer. I don't want my software developers to leave, so I'm going to have to pay them at the 90th percentile, say. 
And that leads to things like software developer pay going up, which it does. But there are other kinds of roles where maybe there's decreasing demand. And so then you're kind of looking for, you know, then you don't need to be paying the 90th percentile. So you can use the comp benchmarking to get a sense of where you need to be paying to keep talent. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be paying at the 90th percentile. <laughs> there could be situations where you actually can be offering below median pay and you can do that in an informed way. So what, what I hear you saying is having this granular information, it really helps a leader make informed decisions at the end of the day, better decisions than they otherwise would, would when they're, they have a limited data set and they're doing things manually. Yeah, exactly. There's one last thing that I want to highlight on that I'm really excited about and that we have some parts of it working in the Nebula platform and I can't wait to get more of them out and live, but it's this idea of automating personalized outreach so that when I've sourced somebody and I'm reaching out to them, we automatically suggest for you that initial outreach message and it is bespoke, it is customized to that particular individual for the particular role that you're having them hire for, which is the kind of outreach that people are actually responsive to. If it feels like spam, if it feels like an email that's being sent to lots of different people, you're not likely to be responsive. And so there's this, by adopting a tool like that, and by the way, it isn't just for the initial message. We can also be suggesting responses, which take into account the context of all of the previous conversation. And also you could be uploading information like information on onboarding or information on benefits and all of those things, all of those documents, our AI can be referencing those documents in their responses. So if the person asks, you know, is a visa supported? You don't have to look that up. It's just in the docs that you uploaded and, and, and we can pull that out. So tons of time-saving uh, potential there, but it's also, at least for people who adopt this soon before it's widespread, there's a huge opportunity because you're going to be able to send outreach that is better than you can probably do yourself. So it's this kind of paradoxical situation where you have a machine that actually creates messages that are more human feeling to the recipient yeah. Then a human would write themselves. Do you have a vision for like, it's obviously personalized to that, that person that you're the candidate that you're going after, but it could the message be in the voice of the hiring manager? Like, are you all also like learning how they speak? Absolutely. Uh, or write? Absolutely. Yes? You could provide examples, like provide outreach, like in the style of these messages for sure. That's incredible. So that's like, that's going to happen in the near future is what you're saying. Cause you're working on that. There is no technical reason well, you can't do that today. And I am racing to get exactly that functionality out in Nebula. <laughs> Incredible. So what do the next five years look like? Have you thought that far into the future? Or are you just worried about the next like year? Yeah, it's a tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> like what are the capabilities going to look like with all this computing power and I think learning? it's a kind of a general trend for the human resources space. My dream is that people working in human resources can spend less time on tasks that can be automated and they can focus more on the kinds of things that probably excited them about getting involved in HR or recruiting in the first place, which is building relationships with great people, finding them work that they love. And if you're an HR head, you know, things like building culture in your company, instead of dealing with um, going through all of the people that responded to a LinkedIn posting. Yeah. John, this has been an awesome discussion. I mean, like you, you gave me more information than I, I ever knew on this subject. And I just so appreciate you sharing your expertise. Um, what do you want to leave people with as kind of a parting thought in, in terms of this conversation or what's to come? Like get people excited. Yeah, I guess the overall arching theme that I would like to convey is that AI, for me, there's nothing to be afraid of here. There are absolutely risks. You need to be mindful of those risks. So things like the bias risk that we talked about in this episode, you need to be pressing your vendors to ensure that they have thought those things through. And even as you kick the tires, maybe initially make sure that you're not seeing bias in the algorithms. But beyond that, embrace these tools because if you don't, <laughs> you're going to be left behind by people who do. So don't be afraid of AI tools. Find one that works for you, works well with the systems that you have, and embrace more of them, integrate them together, 
consolidate them where you can into one system and you can save time, you can save money, you can save headaches and you can do more of the work that you love. Well said. Uh, where can people learn more about you, connect with you if you're willing to, to connect with people who are listening? Oh, for sure. Yeah, if people are listening to this and you would like a demo of the platform, please absolutely reach out to me. So my email address is john, J-O-N, at nebula.io. John at nebula.io. Just, yeah, feel free to send me a message. I would love to give you a demo of the platform. I'll do it myself and would love to hear your feedback on it and talk you through all the capabilities that we talked about in this episode. Um, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm John Crone on LinkedIn, and you can send me a message that way as well. With LinkedIn, I'm actually kind of like overwhelmed with um, requests with connection requests. So for that one, for, please actually, you'll have to put in the connect request, like a message that says like, I heard you on the transform your workplace podcast. Um, and if I see that in there, then I'll accept the connect request and same thing, you know, you can ask me questions or we can pop on a demo of the platform. And then more generally, I mean, you can go to nebula.io and you can create a free account right now and you get credits like freemium tier credits to be able to try a few searches, a few contact lookups, a few job description generations, which is something that we didn't even talk about in this episode that you can do with our platform. And yeah, so yeah, check it out or reach out to me. I'd love to show you around. My guest today has been John Crone. Thanks for coming on, man. appreciate you. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in for today's episode of Transform Your Workplace. The content on this show is strictly for general information and educational purposes only so that you can go transform your workplace in a positive way. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on the show are the guest's own and don't represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of either Zenium HR, the sponsor of the show, or me, the host, Brandon Laws. Additionally, Zenium HR or myself, Brandon Laws, doesn't endorse any guest, their business, or any organization they represent. So discretion is advised. We encourage you to work with a trusted advisor to find a custom approach that fits your organization's needs. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode.